Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Comments to access at telus.net. We are not Shaw. Hello, and I'm Gennar G. O'Sullivan. Welcome to Access TV as we shamelessly promote our friends and our community. December 10th is the International Day of Human Rights. One of the key concerns for the people of the downtown east side is the right to subsidize housing in expensive inner cities. Wendy Peterson joins DJ Larkin to talk about her work in this area. DJ Larkin has recently joined the Pivot Legal Society. My name is Wendy Peterson. Welcome to Access TV, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. As many of you know, housing is a human right. Um, and there's no other place in Canada where housing is an issue um, other than the downtown east side. So in 2012, a thousand condominiums were, units were uh, approved in my neighborhood, the downtown east side. Meanwhile, 5,000 residents live in substandard single room occupancy hotels, or SROs, and they're desperately waiting for much needed ho um, housing replacement. So we have here in the studio today uh, one person who intends to help the community um, to, uh, with problems related to the single room occupancy hotels, and that's DJ Larkin, and I'm really happy to have you here, DJ. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So um, some viewers uh, out there uh, might recall that uh, former Pivot Legal Society lawyer David Eby, uh, who is now the new NDP uh, MLA who beat the Premier Christy Clark in her riding, um, he also used to work for Pivot Legal Society. He started as a young lawyer and a housing activist there. And I'm wondering, DJ, if you're going to be carrying on some of the groundwork that David <laughs> Eby laid out for us in the downtown east side. What are you going to be up to in your new job? Well, I can definitely say that uh, David did lay a really, really amazing foundation for the work that we do. And everyone kind of deals with the work in their own way. And what I've decided to do is focus on a couple of key areas right now. So what I'll be doing is focusing on the criminalization of homelessness and people who use public spaces. Uh, what does that mean? Just quickly. Sure. Well, it means a few different things. First, uh, Vancouver has bylaws that make it possible to um, continuously push people around who have to sleep outside. It makes it against the law to put up a tent, to put up a box, to even really have a shopping cart on the street. Okay, what are the other issues that you're sure. working on? Uh, we're also working on housing stock issues um, in the downtown east side specifically, and that has to do with the human right to be in your housing, to not be bullied out of your housing, and to not be rent evicted from your housing illegally so that uh, housing stock can be um, moved along to higher rental, high, higher rental rates. Okay, so in August of 2013, you launched a, uh, a campaign mm -hmm. um, in front of a substandard SRO hotel in the downtown east side. Can you tell me a little bit about that uh, hotel and, ha and how it describes um, what's happening to low-income people in the downtown east side? Sure. Well, that hotel is a really classic example of gentrification. And I do mean that in the really sort of scientific meaning of that word, not as a derogatory term. Gentrification is a way that neighborhoods change. Um, they change by increasing rents, increasing the income of people in the, in the neighborhood by building new places, renovating. The issue with this hotel and... Uh, What's it called? Yeah, it was the York Hotel, uh, is the, the result of that uh, gentrification process in displacing people. Uh, and the process by which it is done. So that's where you really run into a, a huge problem of human rights, where the residents who have come to me and talked to me have expressed that they're feeling pushed out of their housing. They don't feel welcome in their home anymore. Um, some have expressed that they've been evicted, they believe, illegally. And what's happening to the hotel now? Right. So th that's exactly the gentrification process you see. Now the hotel is being rented at considerably higher rates, up 
on average in $100 more per month. Uh, so between $525 and $550 for an SRO room, which, while it is affordable to a moderate-income person, is no longer affordable to the people who used to live there. And that's, that's classic gentrification. That's what it is. And uh, the result of it is the concerning part around displacing people from their homes. Did you make some recommendations to the City of Vancouver about what they could do to stop that process from happening at the York and in other hotels in the downtown east side? Definitely. Uh, so we have talked to the city, and there's two really key recommendations to the city here. Number one is they have access to these buildings, and they, in fact, have an SRO task force. And what we want the city to do is to actually take that task force and investigate what's going on in the buildings, see if there is higher than average turnover rate, see what's happening, talk to the residents, keep an eye on this so that we can stop it before people are starting to get evicted illegally, before people are displaced. The second thing we ask the city to do is to protect low-income housing stock using their SRO bylaw, which they already have in place but isn't working, uh, to actually protect this housing as low-income housing. Mm -hmm. um, there's some disagreement on their part about whether or not they can actually do that, but we're continuing to press them on that. Did the city follow your advice? Not yet. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> so we'll have to stay tuned. And, and are, you, do you, are you planning more pressure? or? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, it's not the end of the story by any stretch. <laughs> So December 10th is the International Day of Human Rights. Uh, is what happening at these hotels and at the York Hotel, is it a violation of human rights? I believe it is on two levels. First, it's a violation of human rights strictly by Canadian law to um, discriminate against somebody because of their source of income, including income assistance, pension and disability. Uh, it's a real violation of people's human rights when you actually think about housing as a right, and it is it really must be considered a basic human fundamental right. Canada has recognized it, and we really need to step up the law in that area to really reflect that. Okay. Is, um, well, Pivot's known for strategic litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, is, there, is there somebody to sue in all this? <laughs> Can you make a legal case based on this problem, or is that way down the road in terms of thinking? around this? Um, there's, definitely, there's definitely litigation to be had. Mm. It's complicated. Um, in this sense, when you, see, when you see a pattern of people being pushed out because they're on income assistance or disability, then you can take a look at that landlord and say, I think this is a pattern. I think it's discriminatory. I think you're pushing out a specific person for that reason. And there's a lawsuit to be had there. So um, finally, uh, why do you think viewers should be, should be concerned and should care about this problem in general? Yeah, people need to be concerned because in our communities, unless we're supporting people who are most on the margins in terms of their housing, unless we support that group of people, the entire community suffers. We need to be inclusive and we need to start looking at our society, every single member of our communities as active members of the community. Nobody is outside of it. Nobody is not a member. Nobody is an undesirable. Mm -hmm. And until we really fundamentally shift our views and start respecting people who are homeless, people who are as close to homeless as they could possibly be living in emergency shelters, we, will, we won't actually make the progress that we need to make to build strong communities. Right. So if viewers are interested to get involved, mm -hmm. uh, what could they do? Well, the most basic thing you could do is uh, give your feedback. Tell your story. Um, and make sure that you know, make sure that your voice is heard. There's a project going on right now called the Housing Justice Project, and they're doing a survey of people's rental and housing uh, situations. So you can actually go and visit their website at housingjustice.ca and uh, click on Get Involved and make sure that your voice gets heard. So get involved, viewers, and we wish um, Access TV wishes DJ Larkin the best of luck and. Um, doing all of the, the work that, you're, that you have ahead of you in the downtown east side around housing issues. And it was an honor to have you on the program, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So that was okay. That was all right. One take? Know. One take, I, I don't think. Know. Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Comments to access at telus.net. We are not Shaw. And thank you, DJ Larkin. Now next, we have a clip from Lucas Meyer, a Vancouver filmmaker, who is doing a short film on the new housing boom in the community. Make it soft, make it 
good gal won't know. Make me a pallet on your floor. You know I'll never be satisfied. Till I can take that train and ride. If I come back to this town with no place to go, make me a pallet on your floor. Make me a pallet on your floor. Make me a pallet on your floor. Make it soft, make it low, so my good gal won't know. Make me a pallet on your floor. Up the country in the cold sleet and snow. Up the country in the cold sleet and snow. Well, I'm going up the country in the cold sleet and snow. No telling how much further I may go. Make me a pallet on your floor. Make me a pallet on your floor. Make it soft, make it low, so my good gal won't know. Make me a pallet on your floor. Come all ye good time friends of mine. Come all ye good time friends of mine. When I had a dollar, you treated me just fine. Where were you when I only had a dime? Make me a pallet on your floor. Make me a pallet on your floor. Make it soft, make it low, so my good gal won't know. Make me a pallet on your floor. Way I'm sleeping, my back and shoulders are tired. Well, the way I'm sleeping, my back and shoulders are tired. Yes, the way I'm sleeping, my back and shoulders are tired. I'm going to turn round and try the other side. Make me a pallet on your floor. Make me a pallet on your floor. Make it soft, make it low, so my good gal won't know. Make me a pallet on your floor. Welcome back to Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Recently, or previously, we just talked about housing as a human right, and now we're going to continue our exploration of human rights by taking some time to explore human security as a human right. So on a national scale, we can see human security posed as antithetical to national security or state security by various states, including our own. The perceived preservation of state security at the real cost of human security is a common and frightening theme. We can see this in the institution of things like security certificates, drones, and the NSA surveillance regime, as well as in reforms to immigration and refugee laws and heavy-handed and abusive policing. Here in the downtown east side, we can see the detrimental and destructive effects of a state that puts its own security at the risk or above that of its citizens. Human security is almost non-existent and unacknowledged. Pivot and Van Du, 
Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users Society recently released a report that put into sharp relief the heavy-handed policing of these streets. The report found that 95% of some bylaws were enforced exclusively in the downtown east side. We can also see the lack of human security affect some populations more directly and destructively than others. This includes, or a good example of this, is the Missing and Murdered Women's Inquiry. So joining us today are Jennifer Allen and Anthony Guitar from the Vancouver uh, Cop Watch and Nate Crompton from Vandu, Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. And so what we're going to do is we're going to ask Michael Vaughn, who's also joining us from BCCLA, to talk to us a little bit about the broader aspect of national security and some of the logic behind that. So welcome, Michael Vaughn. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we might want to highlight here is the human cost of what I would call risk logic. Risk logic is a categorization that is completely over-inclusive. The risk category based on standards of suspicion, a spidey sense standard, sometimes we refer to it, or profiling, racial, religious, and political profiling, is all about gathering together as many people as possible who fall into this category of suspicion. And those people are subject to jeopardy and life chances that are at detriment because they are flagged, because they are in the system, uh, be that FinTrack, which looks at um, terrorist financing, or organized crime, money laundering, on a standard of suspicion, right. right, to rendition to torture. There's no concern bureaucratically with the over-inclusion in these categories. The only concern is under-inclusion. So of course, people are put at peril by being in any one of these categories. And the degree to which risk logic is now um, ascendant, not only in national security, but in intelligence-led policing on the ground, we can see more and more people having the presumption of innocence um, eroded and taken away from them. So then talk to us a little bit about this presumption of innocence um, and how it is being eroded through some of these uh, surveillance regimes or some of the legislation that we're seeing being put in place recently. Well, I think Canadians would be stunned to find out, for example, um, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada recently put out a report about FinTrack, which is the one that, as I say, looks at the, uh, the tracking of possible terrorist financing and money laundering. What gets you into FinTrack is somebody reporting that you've had what they consider to be a suspicious transit transaction, monetarily. What the Privacy Commissioner of Canada did was did an audit of what was being reported to FinTrack. Things like sending money to your children abroad who are studying at universities in other countries. Mm -hmm. Things like, you know, um, paying in cash for something. I mean, things that have completely innocent explanations, and yet not only do you not know you're in FinTrack, but where that information is flowing, be it Canada Border Services, be it CRA, et cetera, et cetera, is totally non-transparent. So the issue here of, well, I could speak to, I could answer anyone who thought that this was a suspicious transaction, doesn't exist because it's all happening behind this opaque wall of, again, risk logic and securitization. So which is definitely putting sort of this larger uh, state security ahead of then, again, the individual security or, or life chances that you're talking about here. Absolutely. Right. So now I'm going to ask maybe um, Copwatch to talk to us a little bit about um, the, the real human effects on the ground of this kind of risk logic. Um, do you have any comments on that? Well, what that basically looks like is we see a lot of racial profiling, we see a lot of discrimination, we see a lot of harassment. Um, police, uh, we see police target people based on their skin color, based on their social status, based on um, how much money they make, like how much their income is. And in the downtown east side, as you know, we have a vast population of different cultures. And we found like if you're Spanish or if you're Iranian or if you're black or Chinese, the cops automatically think you're a drug dealer. And they lump you into that area. And once you're lumped in that area, it's very dangerous. Because then they get you know, the drug unit and then the gang units to come look for you. You get followed around. You get treated like you're a criminal. And all you are is you're a poor person living in a poor neighborhood trying to survive. And so we see a lot of racial profiling, and we see a lot of discrimination, we see a lot of harassment when people put in police complaints. So if you're being followed around by the police because they think you're a criminal, and you put in a police complaint, the police will follow you around to convince you to drop that police complaint. Right. Um, we see that police are never held accountable in the downtown east side. The downtown east side is seen as, um, to the police it's seen as like 
where all the criminals are. You know, like we need to send the SWAT team down there. We need to make sure you know everyone's rest of Vancouver is safe from the downtown east side. But the police need to see it the other way. The downtown east side is the most vulnerable community in Vancouver. The, the police have to be there to help the people in Vancouver. The Picton Farms didn't help. You know, didn't happen out in Shaughnessy or Kitsilano. It happened in the downtown east side. Or well, actually, it happened in Coquitlam. But they came and got their victims from the downtown east side, because that's where all the vulnerable victims are. Right. But the police don't see them as that. They come to work and they see everyone as criminals. And we need to change that. And also, um, with the professional standards section, there's no, they're just there to make it look like there's police accountability, when actually there really isn't any. And so you can be racially profiled, discriminated, harassed, and you can't go to anyone about it. Anthony, do you have any comments on that? It's all true, and it's it's sad, and it's also things that we're following up on. I mean, Cop Watch is there. We, you know, the VPD tries to intimidate people, but I'll tell you what, I'm there to intimidate the VPD, and I'm doing a damn good job of it. Cop Watch is coming up on their second year, thanks to Jennifer. You know, it's come a long ways. I mean, we do go through a lot of being followed, being harassed. You know, comments by VPD, but I'm still there. We're so still here. And so in regards then to, to human security, what is your conception of what human security is and how much of that is present or not present in, in some of the work that you're doing in the downtown east side? So how do you see the police, um, I guess can you rearrange that question in a different way, um, using the word police? Sure. Well, so human security is, is the concept that we're talking about here. And how does police actions, police brutality affect human security or how secure people feel in the downtown east side? There is no security. Once, you know, you, people in the downtown see the police treating somebody a certain way, harassing them, beating them up or whatever, that drops all security levels. I mean, what kind of security do you think you're going to have if you're watching or if you know of VPD attacking somebody or beating somebody up? Once we see this stuff as Cop Watch, we are tweeting it, and it's also on Facebook. So the rest of the society will know, and it's something that has to be dealt with. Right. I also see something else, that there's something wrong with society when you're scared of your police. Sure. Your police are the people you're supposed to go to when you're in danger, when you get attacked, sexually assaulted. There's a problem when you can't call those people because you're scared they're going to attack or sexually assault you. Right. So now, uh, Pivot and Van Du recently released a report uh, talking about or outlining some of the real discrepancies in policing across uh, the city, specifically in the downtown east side. Uh, did you want to comment some on that? Sure. Um, Vandu's been organizing around the issue of targeted ticketing for now three years. Um, in 2008, there was a really big ticketing blitz, um, kind of in the lead up to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. The police kind of were basically given instruction to give out as many tickets as they could for minor offenses like vending and jaywalking, um, kind of arbitrarily to whoever was in the neighborhood. Um, since then, there's been a slight decrease just because that blitz was so intense. Nonetheless, uh, the ticketing is, is targeted to the downtown east side, and the recent Freedom of Information request shows that 95% um, of the vending and, and, and ticket, uh, bylaw tickets are given out just in that six block radius. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a pretty clear um, targeting of a specific population. Um, so, you know, clearly the human security there is, is non existent, as Anthony just said. Right. So, um, in regards to the human security that we're talking about in the downtown east side, there definitely is uh, some resistance to the, the ticketing. And I think the downtown east side Sunday market is definitely a good example uh, of that resistance. And I think up next, what we're going to do is take a look uh, at a clip about the downtown east side Sunday market. Mending hearts and saving lives. The downtown east side street market, situated at the corner of West Hastings and Carroll, started as a protest against vending tickets in 2010. It is essentially an occupation, right? It's an occupation because its origin is a protest. And we're protesting the vending tickets given out to vendors because they vend on the sidewalks in other non-legal, non-sanctioned areas. So if we, we feel like if we had a season, or if we gave up a Sunday, or we gave up a month even during the winter, then those vendors would have nowhere to go. Hi, my name's Mickey. I'm a downtown vendor, and I think it's a good idea to keep this vending on Sundays going because it helps with uh, our little bit of money with the income that we get. And I think it'd be a fool if you closed it. I'm going to do a petition if you do. The vending tickets, people who sell through the week, the vending tickets, I've got two of them already. Sunday's the only day I can pray I'd be safe and not worry about tickets and be 
being arrested. The market now provides free vending space to over 200 vendors every Sunday at Pigeon Park and will be expanding to 62 East Hastings on other days of the week. Um, lots of these vendors, they rely on this market. They make $50 to $100 on a Sunday and this supplements their welfare. It means the difference between you know, standing in food lines all the time or being able to buy some groceries right, and being a little independent. This market provides over $500,000 per year of direct economic injection into the hands of the poorest, most marginalized residents of the downtown east side and removes more than 20 tons of waste annually from landfills. There's a lot of people in downtown east side that want to help people, but the way they're coping is, is basically handout. But I believe that uh, a lot of people make them feel better if they just go out and work. It makes them feel better, it makes them empowered in their everyday life. The vendors collect their items from garbage bins all over the city of Vancouver and come from the most marginalized groups. People are, are trying to make money and they're actually doing good for themselves and it's helping them and it's helping to stay clean. And right now, when they're done their uh, vending here, they're uh, selling, they feel better about themselves. According to Roland, one third of the vendors are women, many current or former sex trade workers, as much as half are native. A significant minority are from the nearby Chinese retirement community, and the majority are either homeless or underhoused living in SROs. It's a, it's a great place to be. I come here all the time and I find things that I need for a really low price, and I think it's a positive thing for the vendors and the people buying down here. So I come here all the time, I sell things down here, and it seems to be a, a great space. If we, if we were able to be more sheltered from the rain, that'd be even better. The market is run by and the society is governed by volunteers from the same marginalized groups to ensure that the market stays close to its roots and always provides free legal vending space for the poorest in the community. The market runs every Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., rain or shine. Please support the downtown east side street market. For more information, go to www.dtesstmkt.blogspot.ca. Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Comments to access at telus.net. We are not Shaw. The city of Vancouver celebrates and commemorates 50 years of the Muslim local community. MTS Papet interviews Haroon Khan. Welcome back to Access Community Television, where we promote our friends and community. My name is MTS Poppet, and joining me is Harun Khan, President of the Pakistan Canada Association, that's celebrating its 50th anniversary this month, um, and also the establishment of the first mosque here in Vancouver. And your father was involved in both initiatives. So tell us about that. Thank you, MTS. Thanks for having me here, and it's good to be here on Access TV. Uh, MTS, 50 years ago, the, uh, the Al Jamia Masjid was, was founded, the first mosque in BC, as uh, you had uh, mentioned, and it was founded by my father, Riyasat Ali Khan. Now, my dad um, was involved in many, many things in his life, in multiculturalism mm -hmm. and uh, inclusion and communities, but his first achievement uh, was really his most enduring one. Mm -hmm. uh, the Al Jamia Masjid and the Pakistan Canada Association have... Uh, have been around for some time and uh, as a spiritual home for the uh, for BC's it's Muslim community. It's located just off 8th Avenue near... Yeah, Oak. 655 West 8th near City Hall. 
and uh, it, uh, it's open year-round, uh, 365 days a year for five daily prayers. We also observe many of our um, religious and cultural, mm -hmm. um, uh, including Ramadan, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Haroon, uh, Muslims have been here in the West Coast for a long time. In yes. fact, your family was involved in uh, uh, bringing food to the Komagotamaru more right here behind us at, at, at Cole Harbor. Yes, yes. 1914. That's right. We're coming on nearly 100 years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is uh, actually a very shameful uh, part of uh, BC's history. And uh, this is where this, this ship was uh, of migrant workers uh, right. docked here with every expectation for them to, uh, to land and to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a, a real movement afoot to keep uh, Vancouver a white mm -hmm. uh, city. And uh, so unfortunately, these poor people were in limbo. Mm -hmm. And during that time, the local community that was here, that included my, fa my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and many other people, mm -hmm. they had to organize something, some relief to go and help these people. So they brought food over to the ships to make sure they had some comforts uh, and to know that they were really cared for here. But unfortunately, the story has a very uh, a sad conclusion. They were essentially exiled and sent right back to India, and many of them were killed when they got back. In fact, you're carrying on that tradition with the Jamia Masjid and the Pakistan Association here in the downtown east side during Ramadan. You actually do organize a, f a food drive. We and sure and do. Um, it's called uh, Ramadan Spirit. Uh, we've uh, with, uh, done our seventh annual one. We're going into our eighth. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we work very closely with the relief agencies in the downtown east side, the First United Church, uh, uh, among many, many organizations. And uh, uh, we work with the Interfaith Alliance to End uh, Homelessness as well. And uh, it's something that uh, is a very long-term long commitment uh, fr from our uh, uh, association to really give back to the community, be engaged in the community. You, you are only as good as what you can do. And, uh, and we really feel it's an honor in, uh, uh, for us to do so. And it uh, doesn't matter what race you are, what religion you are, what color of the skin you are, we're all brothers and sisters. And to be able to give, and especially during this month of Ramadan, uh, it's, um, it's truly a, a very powerful experience for us. Uh, to be able to do that, and we're very humbled by it. Right, and the other big issue here in the downtown east side is homelessness, and you've actually been involved in the homelessness tr strategy for the mayor and hosted a forum at the mosque. That's right. We had uh, Rich Coleman was our chief guest at that time, and he was the minister of housing at that time, and he's still very involved in this issue. Uh, so him, uh, Gregory Robertson, city council, a lot of the, the, the various stakeholders that are in, in involved in really advocating for this issue um, they've really been very strong in trying to determine what can we do as faith-based communities. If you look at it, it's the faith-based communities, the Salvation Armies, the other, uh, other groups that are the first feet on the ground mm -hmm. to be able to go and take care of these actions. Mm -hmm. But what coordination is there? This is where you have all of these various representatives from the Jewish community, the uh, Sikh community, the uh, Hindu, Muslim. You, know, you have all of them coming together because it's the one issue that we may diverge right. on various issues of our faith. Right. But we all have in common the, the, the real importance, the sacred duty, really, to go and uh, feed the hungry. And uh, it's, it's, it's very, very important. In fact, we're doing an event on December 10th to yes. feed the hungry in downtown Eastside. Hopefully, you'll join us. Absolutely. Maybe invite the mayor. Maybe he can commit to ending homelessness here in the downtown Eastside. Certainly Side. bring it up with him, yeah. yeah. That's right. So, Haroon, thanks for joining us. So, talking to Haroon Khan. My name is MTS Poppet. Um, watching Access Community Television, promoting our friends and community. Thank you. Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Comments to access at telus.net. We are not Shaw. So my name is Teresa. I'm with the Heart of the City Festival. And this is a walking tour, part of a project that the Vancouver District Labor Council and the Carnegie Community Action Project put together with a bit of funding from the City of Vancouver. And uh, it's a plaque project that laid or installed 12 plaques throughout the neighborhood, six commemorating labor history moments in time, and six commemorating community moments in time. So the first plaque commemorates the murder of Frank Rogers down on the waterfront. 
on the railway tracks just to the north of us. He wasn't a, a railway worker, but there was a newly formed union down on the railway for loading the cars. They were on strike, trying to get their first contract. He was accosted by a private police officer and a staff. Shots were fired, and uh, he was hit three times. And he didn't die immediately, but he was hospitalized and died a couple of days later. So this flag was up for probably less than an hour. When the manager of the Pacific Hotel, Patricia Hotel, was asked why he didn't let Olaf stay, he replied, we're not a nursing home. The trek took place in 1935, and it left Vancouver on June 3rd from these railway tracks right below us. What they were looking for was a national program of welfare and uh, unemployment insurance, and so they decided to take their case to Ottawa, and it became the On to Ottawa track. So um, in 1984, there was a camp in here. When the march originated, it was to make a, 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 an awareness of, you know, that we wanted the police to take some action, that we wanted them to actually investigate these these. The Liberal government of Paul Martin and the opposition party at that time of Stephen Harper colluded to provide a no-apology, no-compensation redress. Uh, the Prime Minister came and he was greeted by 200 seniors, well, 150. I'm talking about seniors, not like me at 65 and all that. I'm talking seniors. Two of them were over 100 years old. This is the first time that any of these people had ever even challenged the government. You'll hear that almost all of these stories took a fight, took an illegal fight, either squatting or a camp or a... Uh, an illegal injection site. So and it fits into patterns that we also know around the world that any place that a, a, an official safe injection site has been open, there has always been an illegal safe injection site open prior to that to push the issue into... Uh, I also wanted to tell you about a fight that we had in the plaque committee with the city <laughs> over one word. One. Yeah. So we said... Um, we had it said, saying the squad succeeded in stopping the private sale of Woodward's building and the struggle for Woodward's won some social housing, but the accompanying invasion of condos into the heart of the neighborhood displaced more low-income residents than it housed. So the city could not handle the word invasion. Uh, so we, we thought about it and thought about it. Should we cave? Should we cave? So finally we caved and we put influx of condos instead of invasion. And then somebody at the planning or somebody put it, and the whole slack project was held up for a year while the city figured out whether it could deal with the word influx. <laughs> Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Comments to access at telus.net. We are not Shaw. During the 20th century, we had over 12,000 First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who served in the American and the Canadian Armed Forces. Today we have two First Nations war vets who served in the United States but are Canadians. We have Mike D'Angeli, also Woody Morrison. How are you today? Good. 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 Yeah, happy to be here. Yes. yes. Can you tell us where you served? I served 10 years in the U.S. Army Airborne Rangers. Uh, I was stationed all over, all over the United States and overseas. Well, I was in the United States Navy and um, my primary duty station was aboard a flagship for the U.S. Second, uh, Second Fleet and for Striking Force Atlantic for NATO. So we spent a lot of time in the Caribbean. And before Vietnam came along, we spent time in the North Atlantic, Scandinavian countries, Europe, that sort of thing. Recalling these memories hard for you uh, to revisit? 
You know, Woody? it's sort of funny in a way, you know. I think I had PTSD before I went into the military. Mm -hmm. from, Is that post-traumatic stress? Yeah, yeah, from the um, residential schools. Oh. Because I was 21 when I, I knew I was going to get drafted into the U.S. military, and I didn't want to get drafted, so I volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went for four more years instead of, you know, instead of just two years in the Army. See, he was smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you begin your journey? I joined at 17. <clears throat> to my mother's horror, I had to actually have her. I was uh, on December 22nd, uh, 1990. Uh, you had to be 17 to join. And I brought my mom over to the, uh, the uh, enlistment office and had her sign her only child, her baby, Aww. to the U.S. Army, which she's still very angry about, and, and I apologize, Mom. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, uh, I did that, and, and um, it was, uh, you know, as, as you get older, you, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, mm -hmm. you know, and you, and you think back, and yeah, there's, uh, I, I, have, um, I have some difficulty, in them, and I'm really grateful for people like Uncle Woody who, you know, were able to talk and, and uh, deal through some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the things I always, and, I, and when I go in and we lead a dance group called the Get High X Dancers, meaning people with a copper shield. Oh, yeah. And so we, you know, we, with my art and with the dance group, I, I've, it's a great way of working through a lot of those uh -huh. things, a lot of those issues. But the one thing I always say is, is that um, I got to travel the world. I got to see some of the most beautiful places on this, in this planet, uh, but got to see how ugly as human beings we treat each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, how did they treat you in the armed forces as, as a Native person? Well, at first, you know, they didn't know I was Native. I looked uh -huh. like my Scottish ancestors. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, when I was in boot camp, some of the guys, some of the rednecks started giving me a hard time. And then, uh, much to their peril, they found out it wasn't a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so they started leaving me alone. But, you know, one of the things I want to clarify, too, is that uh, Mike introduces me as a Vietnam veteran because I served during the Vietnam War, but I didn't go to Vietnam. My younger brother was there. He was uh, on these, what they call PBRs, uh, Patrol Boat River there in the Mekong Delta and Mekong River. So my time was spent in the Caribbean. And uh, I think the hardest part for me was when I got out was because it was like getting sent away to residential school. Everything that was familiar was gone. Mm -hmm. All my buddies, there was nobody there. I didn't know when I was going to get paid or where I was going to eat. Nothing, just... And then veterans, it's like a dirty shirt. They just throw you in the corner and leave you. And, mm -hmm. and then you got no place to go, and you wander around just in the fog. And I got recalled twice. And the second time, I went to a senator, and I told him, if I have to go back, I'm going to desert. Because I think you ought to get all the cripples and the old ladies and everybody before me if you need some foul-ups. There's a lot of them out there, so go get them, not me. And so the senator got me out of it having to go back because uh, they'd extended my enlistment twice. And um, I don't know. I just sometimes, you know, there's one guy that I served with we still keep in contact. And we have a lot of fun talking about the goofy things, you know, that um, the fun things that we did. And I think this way it kind of keeps away the kind of keeps away the dark, heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, if you can laugh about it. And see, it's sort of funny, you know. I met Mike when he was about ten years old, <laughs> and it turns out we both have birthdays on December twenty second. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, and, 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 and part of that, too, and, and Uncle and I will, will definitely talk about that with, with each other, but he, he had my grandfather who served during World War II, mm -hmm. stayed behind when MacArthur left and fought uh, with, the, with the Filipino people, uh, guerrilla warfare against the Japanese. And so they, those two had, had each other, and I'm really grateful for, you know, we're, we're family. Yeah. You know, and, and so I'm really grateful that I have somebody like Uncle Woody that I could sit and talk to, and we both fume and, and <laughs> talk about things that, that frustrate us. The number one thing that I think that both really frustrates us, <clears throat> and uh, you, you re-victimization or whatever you want to call it, the one thing that we find frustrating is the fact that our politicians, media, what have you, keep talking about how our veterans are dying off. 
well, how can that be when we're right here? That's right. How can that be when we're creating veterans every day by sending them to Afghanistan, sending them to Iraq or wherever else mm -hmm. where our, our soldiers, our men and women are being sent? So to oversimplify, and, and, our, and people oversimplify everything, mm -hmm. and it doesn't pay tribute to the, the complexities of who we are as, as individuals, regardless of your First Nations, regardless of your whatever your ethnicity is. And so that's one thing that I find the most frustrating and being able to come onto programs like this, both, both Woody and I have done this quite a bit where we talk about that. We talk about how we're still creating this, this um, stigma, you know, a part of the machine, unfortunately. But at the same time, this is a long history amongst our peoples. I'm fifth generation military, but I'm also fourth generation residential school survivor. You know, see my mother's family, most of them were Marines. And they teased me a lot, you know, because I didn't join the Marine Corps. You were talking about the status. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the, uh, the detrimental conditions of being a part of the American and Canadian Armed Forces? Well, in Canada, if you joined the Armed Forces, you lost your status, you became enfranchised. And so what happened, like after World War II and there's other times, there was land set aside, they taken from the reserves, so the veterans would get these land grants, but they, the, the, the First Nations people didn't get any because the land came from the reserve and they had no status because they were enfranchised mm -hmm. and they couldn't even go back to the reserve. Wow. So they wanted to protect their homeland, so they came over to us because they could serve there without them counting against their Indian status. Which is every one of my family and, and uncle's family as well that had served. So. Mm -hmm. That is, that is quite the history, mm -hmm. an amazing part of the history that very few people know. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that with us, Woody. Thank you for and having us. Michael? Well, thank you. One of the things that I was thinking of as Mike was talking there, and you mentioned there was 12,000. In the U.S., American Indians, Native Americans, however you want to call us, are the single largest ethnic, ethnic group in the U.S. military and the intelligence communities. And I come from a village called Heidelberg, and there's probably three, maybe 400 people there. And during the Vietnam War, there were 33 of us in uniform from our village, which is, you know, this was not unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't join because of the American flag or the Canadian flag. This is my home. This is my land. I know the stories. You know, you want to talk to Harper and those guys, they don't know the stories. All they know is they're going to rip something out of the ground to try to make money off. That's our relatives. That's right. They're killing all of our relatives, whether it's the trees, the fish, the birds, the animals. They kill every damn thing because they brought to us the concept of unconditional surrender when they brought their wars to us. We didn't have that. Sure, we fought, you know, and this guy's and us, you know, sometimes they weren't real fights. We'd arrange it and advance that way, you know, it could... They'd let us steal their ugly women, and we'd let them <laughs> steal our ugly women. You know? and that's Mike D'Angeli and Woody Morrison, and this is Access TV. So, you know, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, people don't realize... Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Comments to access at telus.net. We are not Shah. Coats come see what? Adzik Sogoru, Oexit Neen, Coast Salish Nagetku, Oexit Neen, Nabib, Gagi Nabib, Woody. I'll translate later. <laughs> This song was survived through my grandfather, Samoyge Oye, Chief Reggie D'Angeli. This song was sung by my ancestors, the Tzitzawit, when we returned home from combat, and we would laugh and taunt our enemies because we had survived. In recent history, my great-grandfather, a veteran of World War I, when he returned home, our family sang this song. My grandfather, Reggie, was a World War II veteran, and when he returned home, our family sang this song. My Uncle Bill, a Vietnam veteran, when he returned home, our family sang this song. 
My two cousins were in the U.S. Navy and the United States Marines, and I myself served 10 years as a U.S. Army Airborne Ranger. When we returned home from our tours of duty in combat, our family sang this song. Not only do we continue to sing this song for our warriors, but also our veterans, like my uncle Woody Morrison, a Vietnam veteran. But we sing this song for our residential school survivors. We sing this song for our young ones when they graduate from Head Start to elementary school, to middle school, to high school, to college and university. Next year, when my Naksu, my wife, graduates from UBC, she'll be the very first Aboriginal woman to hold a doctorate in the study of our art history. We'll sing this song for her then. We sing this song every opportunity we can because missionization, global policies, residential schools did not work against us. We are still practicing our language, our songs, our cultures, our traditions. We are not just surviving, we are thriving. The fact is, is that we have to share this world that we live in. So if you're taking the time to watch this or you're taking the time to be here in the studio today, this is a small victory for all of us. It's a rippling effect. The more we change amongst each other, the more our world changes. So we're singing this victory song for all of us. <clears throat> <laughs> Welcome back to Access TV as we shamelessly promote our friends and our community. We just heard from Woody Morrison and Mike D'Angeli. Uh, we've been following stories. One of the stories we will be following is uh, the recent Union of BC Indian Chiefs resolution on resources and development 2013. 48. Wendy? Did you, did you want me to read a sentence from that resolution? Sure. Um, the Harper government cannot continue to run roughshod over our interests, our title, our rights, and our treaty rights. That's mm -hmm. a really powerful mm -hmm. statement. What Very is it? And it's statement. about resource development in BC? That's right. Consultation over the land is very crucial at this time. And uh, they've made this resol resolution and presented it to the cabinet ministers. And we want to follow this. Um, story in the future. Yes. So um, Access TV is also following another really important issue in BC. Uh, the Minister of uh, International Trade and Multiculturalism, Teresa Watt, has just started a, uh, a consultation with Chinese Canadian associations and citizens in BC uh, as, uh, to formulate a, a, an apology to Chinese Canadians for many years of racist legislation. So we have Sid Tan here in the studio, who's our producer for Access TV. And Sid, is this a good idea, this apology? What's the scoop? Well, the apology is a good idea, but unfortunately the BC government has rigged the pu public consultation process. They have taken off the table financial considerations. And for me, an apology means that the government acknowledges its wrongdoing. They're willing to do that. But an apology should also be redemptive for the giver. And an apology should be healing for the people receiving it. And most importantly, the apology must be accepted by the people receiving it. And I don't think this will be accepted if there isn't any measure of restorative justice. What do you mean by that restorative justice? Is that the financial contribution? What well, well, that's part of it. Because what we have now is a situation where the BC government's message is simply we can profit from racism and keep the proceeds. 
That's what they're saying. The government collected $9 million, equivalent to about $800 million today, in the head tax. And it's still there in the B.C. Treasury. And we want some kind of symbolic and meaningful return of that money to the families that paid that tax. And these families did not, were not included in the Harper thing because their parents were dead. Their parents would have had to be lived to 100 and something. So the result is that these are the elderly sons and daughters who were affected by the exclusion legislation from 1923 to 1947. They're still alive. This is by no means historical. These people have asked us to seek direct individual redress and that's what we're going for. So this is a really important community issue that Access TV is going to continue to follow and I hope you'll keep us updated on it, Sid. It, it's an issue of human rights it and sure on that is. Uh, note I, I think that I should mention to our audience is that Access Community Television is going to have and commemorate the International Day mm -hmm. of Human Rights at the Carnegie Center on the third floor gallery. We're going to be there, we're going to have some refreshments, we're going to have some entertainers, and we're just going to get together. And I'm hoping members from head tax families will be there, people from residential school families will be there, and we'll have a good talk about human rights. So Excellent. we're ready to wrap up. Right on. Excellent. I'll be there. It's been great here on Access TV, and we'd like to thank Wendy, Anushka, Sid, uh, Deborah, the Access crew and volunteers, and we hope to see you again in next month, December. We'll be here. You'll we'll be, be here. here. I'll be here. Talk to you guys later. We'll in the meantime, you check out the heart of the city and the march and the big walk down the street. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, we're closing with that. Yeah. Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. Comments to access at telus.net. We are not Shaw. Let's see. Let's hear that. That'll do, I think. <laughs>